Our gospel reading this morning comes to us from Luke's gospel, the 14th chapter. I invite you to listen now for the word of the Lord. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled and all who... Uh, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said this also, uh, he said also to the one who invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they might invite you in return. And you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. And you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <sighs> Listening to Jesus today just filled me with so many warm thoughts. I, it's a good thing, right, that, that we're not like that anymore. I mean, you know, Jesus had to teach the people back then, don't, don't snatch up the places of honor for yourselves, go to the lower places, you know, don't, don't seek that kind of attention, uh, uh, worry about your status, your elevation over other people. I mean, I'm so grateful that 2,000 years of instruction, human evolution, following the teachings and leadings of Jesus, means we've internalized this. We've learned the lesson. We're no longer plagued by the need, right, to elevate ourselves. We are no longer obsessed with our own image or self-esteem. We as a society, I mean, it's a good thing, right? We don't gravitate mostly towards those who self-promote, who bombast and boast, who take the best seats and the brightest lights, show off as often as possible. <laughs> okay, I guess not, right? I guess maybe... Maybe we're not that different 2,000 years later. Jesus, help us. Oh, we've got a long way to go yet, don't we? After all, I mean, I, I, I'm wearing a robe, sitting on what uh, amounts to a throne in the front of a church sanctuary. I, I get it. I, I, you know, we, we religious types, we Christian ministerial types are not immune to such, you know, Social elevations. You know, when I was a kid, I can remember at the checkout line of the grocery store, the tabloid magazines, and I, and I always get a lot of laughs out of them. They, because back then, they were all these outlandish stories, right? That, that you know, mostly I hope nobody believed. You know, who knows? But... Uh, Headlines like this, Bigfoot seen driving Corvette in downtown Omaha, right? Something like that. Or, or NASA secrets, Elvis living on the dark side of the moon, right? That kind of stuff. Well, somewhere along the way, they figured out they'd get more attention if they moved more into the area of celebrity gossip. 
Because there's a big market for that, isn't there? Boy, we love gossip about famous people. We love gossip, but when you add famous people into it, it's even better. And you know, the people sitting closest to the hosts in Jesus' parable, we like to pay attention to them. We like watching them, talking about them. They get all the attention. As a spiritual leader, I have to say, I, I, I'm rather concerned, right? I get it, all this idol worship, it's mostly just entertainment. It's kind of harmless escapism from our own lives. I understand that. And yet, and yet, and we all know these reality television stars, right? Or people who are famous for being famous, right? It strikes me that we still haven't learned what Jesus is teaching us this morning. We still place a high emphasis on attention, giving attention to people and, and, and situations that don't really need a lot of attention. Jesus said, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So, when you're in a banquet, don't sit down at the place of honor. Sit down away from there. Because you might be called forward. Or you might be called to move down to the end of the line. Now, I don't know if we really believe this. And, and the people who come to church and sit in the back pews, notwithstanding friends. The parable, and it is a parable. I have to point that out. It sounds like instruction, but it's a parable. And we'll come back to that in a minute. But it leaves me with more questions sometimes than it, than it answers. Like, did this actually happen? I mean, was it common to go to a banquet back in those days and, and have the host come in and say, no, nah, you're in the wrong place, move over there. You, over here, uh, you're okay, but I'll let you know. Was that a normal thing to happen? James and John, you might recall, they got into quite a bit of hot water, both with Jesus and with the rest of the disciples when they asked Jesus if they could sit at his right and left hand. Right? Do you remember that? When you come into your glory, can we sit at your right and left hand? We know that it was important to them that you could sit in a place of honor, that you could be positioned in a place of honor in proximity to somebody important. Right? We know that mattered to them. Personally, I, I, I guess, even if Jesus had told James and John they could have the right and left hand, they'd probably then start arguing who got which side. Right? Because it's human nature. But I still have so many questions about the passage. It just, it, you know, this, this thought of sitting in a lower place so maybe you'll be brought up to a higher place seems so calculated, doesn't it? Doesn't it strike you as a little bit of false humility? Don't sit in the high places. Be strategic. Is that really what Jesus is telling us? Like, it's a strategy to be humble. Because maybe then, you'll be, maybe then you'll be brought up and you'll be raised up even higher that way. And everybody will see it. And then others will be moved down so you can move up. And that's even better. I'll be honest with you, all this kind of troubles me. And, and really, when it comes to attention and honor and fame and glory and station, it strikes me that this is all kind of a zero-sum game. Do you know what I mean by a zero-sum game? This, this idea that there's only so much of stuff to go around, and you got to get your share, because when it runs out, it's gone. It's kind of an economic understanding. I do this for you, you do this for me. If there's a winner, there's got to be a loser. There's a cost and an economy for everything. It's tit for tat. Here we are. You get your piece, I get my piece. When it runs out, they don't get a piece. It's a mindset. It's 
a posture, it's an attitude towards life. This, it's a, so, some people call it a scarcity mindset, right? There's, there's a limit to what we've got. And you've got to get yours before it runs out. And it strikes me that everybody invited to Jesus' banquet, the way it's told, is in that mindset. There's so many seats, and the best ones, when they get taken, you're out of luck unless the host comes in and decides to move you up. There's another way of seeing the world. Same people who call that a scarcity mindset call this an abundance mindset. Uh, Michael Hyatt, an author, talks about it. So did Jesus, by the way. You know, I come to give life and give it abundantly. Yeah, which mindset is Jesus talking about here? Or Jesus who feeds thousands of people, right? There's no limit. When the fish ran out, he didn't look at the people and said, sorry, you should have got here sooner. You know what life is like? You got to get yours. Skedaddle. No, that's not what he did. There was no end to the miracle. There was no end to the food, the banquet. There's no end in the heavenly kingdom of God. And so, Michael Hyatt describes this, the abundance mindset as this. These are people uh, who believe there's always more where that came from. They're happy to share their knowledge, contacts, and compassion with others. They default to trust and build rapport with others easily. They welcome competition, believing it makes the pie bigger and everyone better. They ask themselves, how can I give more than can be expected? They are optimistic about the future, Believing the best is yet to come. They think big, embracing risk. They are thankful. That's a big one. They are thankful and confident. And, and according to his writings, and I think this is true, these people also tend to make friends easier than others. They are, they'll be more innovative. They can tend to be more successful in a worldly sense, although that's not what we're looking for or necessarily talking about today. That can be part of it. But he says they tend to be happier and more joyful. They tend to be more fulfilled in what they do. But then the scarcity mindset, right? These are the people, he says, who believe will, there will never be enough. They're stingy. They're default uh, to suspicion. They're pessimistic about the future. They think small, avoiding risk. And they are entitled and fearful. And I, you know, I'll tell you, if I, if I were to title the parable this morning that Jesus told, I, I might think about entitling it, entitling it, The Entitled and Fearful Guests at the Wedding Banquet. Worried about where they get to sit. You know, I'm convinced that a lot of people go through life wondering why things don't quite line up for them or why they don't work out. Because they see a scarcity before they get started. Now, again, this is not necessarily a financial thing, but Jesus says there is an abundance, there is a wealth of blessings in life in following Christ. And he's speaking about generosity and humility and love and joy. But in our parable, he's also talking about pride. Pride juxtaposed with humility and this new kingdom economy open before us. It isn't I give and you give back. It isn't I honor so you can honor me. It isn't I latch on to the people in the highest places so that I'll get a little bit of the glory that falls off of their shoulders. In fact, Jesus will go on to say, after he tells this terrible, when you throw a banquet, don't invite the wealthy. Don't invite the people of privilege because they'll return the favor. Who does he say you invite? He, he says, don't worry about giving anything in return. God will bless you 
because God's blessings are abundant. He's teaching about a new economy. There's more than what we see and we know. There is an abundance. And that abundance mindset, we can, we can follow that much more easily in Jesus' teaching. If we're not worried about which seat to take in the first place. Don't snatch up the best seats, he says. Don't be threatened by others having a place of honor that might seem higher than yours. Trust there will be enough. Enough food, but certainly enough attention and enough affirmation. We can be optimistic, confident, and thankful without having to prove our worth or without having our worth affirmed. Our egos stroked. You know, once again, I want to remind you, and I've said this before, Please don't look at a parable and look for the lesson in the parable. I, I think a parable is trying to do much more than to teach us some simplistic moral of the story is. It's more than that. A parable is, it, it, when Jesus tells a parable, he's trying to reframe reality. He's trying to get us to shift from one way of thinking or seeing things to an entirely different way. He's trying to open our eyes to, to a broader reality, a more spiritual reality. Give us a new posture towards life, a new orientation towards the things around us, a new way of relating to each other, right? Usually it's about the kingdom of heaven. Usually these parables are trying to teach us something about the way the kingdom of heaven will be and should be on earth as we try to usher it in, right? And so this isn't just a lesson about don't be too big for your britches, right? Although that's a good lesson, but it's so much more than that. I suspect that Jesus is really less interested in helping us to get our share by being patient and unassuming. And much more interested in calling into question our whole system of counting everything in the first place. He's questioning the way we account for things. That's why you invite the poor and the blind and the crippled and the lame to your banquet. Because nobody in that crowd is counting. Because nobody in that cow crowd counts for anything in society. At least back then, and that may be another thing that hasn't changed a whole lot since Jesus taught this parable. There's still so many who don't count for very much, whoever they are today. But I, I think Jesus is telling us this. If, you, if it really matters to you who wins the status game, this zero-sum, this scarcity mindset, if you really want to be in the winning column... That's a way of life that eventually is going to let you down. It's topsy-turvy. It's dog-eat-dog. -dog. There's always a bigger fish, to quote Qui-Gon from Star Wars. And you won't be assured of your place. Because you can always be anxious. There'll be somebody to come along. And the host will make you move on down. I think what he's trying to do is open our eyes to a broader perspective. Open our eyes to a mindset of abundance, the abundance he taught in the Sermon on the Mount, the idea of being generous, generous of heart because that flows from compassion and understanding and empathy for each other. Yeah, shouldn't we feel bad for a person who gets moved from a place of honor to a lower place and shamed in front of everybody else? Generosity comes from those places. And true happiness or joy comes from a place of gratitude and that abundance mindset, seeing there being more possibilities in front of us than we could ever imagine. I know I'm going kind of longish today. I, I'm almost done. 
At the end of our passage this morning, you may have caught this, Jesus said something about the resurrection of the righteous. That should clue us in. Yeah, he's talking about the kingdom of heaven here. The resurrection of the righteous, that's the kingdom of heaven, right? We, the righteous, when they're resurrected, they go to heaven, but we also believe we're to pursue the things of heaven on earth as the church. And in that place, yes, the humble will be exalted, and those who are not keeping score will win. And in God's kingdom, really all are victorious. For that matter, in God's kingdom, there's a place for everyone. Everyone. Winner or loser by earth's standards. You have a place in God's heavenly kingdom if we will all accept our place there. And that may be the rub. We all have a place in God's kingdom if we accept the place we have there. The point is there's room for us all. There's room for all of us, everyone. Because in God's kingdom, there are no limits whatsoever. But only abundance upon abundance. Amen.